So welcome everyone. I'm Kathy Edwards. Um, I'm your host for tonight's event. And we want to thank you for joining the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center uh, for the Mind Readers Winter Book Club. We're really thrilled that you're here. And we're going to be discussing the book, Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams by Dr. Matthew Walker. Dr. Walker is a professor of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and the director of its sleep and neuroimaging lab, and a former professor of psychiatry from Howard University. But we have our own experts here at UW who are here on our panel. And um, we really want to raise your awareness of the importance of sleep. This week, not surprisingly, given uh, the time change, is Sleep Awareness Week. And I think some of us are still suffering from losing that hour, at least I am. And it serves as a call to action for the public to recognize their sleep is a crucial part of health and well being. Getting high quality sleep with few interruptions and enough of it each night is critical to your health and to your memory as well. It's one of the most important things you can do during your day. In the book we'll be discussing this evening, author and sleep expert Dr. Matthew Walker explores sleep and explains how it improves learning, mood, energy levels, regulates hormones, prevents cancer, Alzheimer's disease obesity and diabetes, slows the effects of aging, increases longevity, boosts efficiency, success, and overall productivity, all very important. The book describes how caffeine and alcohol affect sleep and what really happens when we dream and how our sleep patterns change throughout life and more. It's a really wonderful read and I know it's been very, very popular um, with our book club members. It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and good friend and moderator for this evening's book club discussion, Dr. Nate Chen. Dr. Chin is a geriatrician who sees patients at UW Health Memory Clinic and serves as the medical director for the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention. That's the RAP study. Dr. Chin is also the host of the very popular and influential Dementia Matters podcast. Um, and I urge you to check out the podcast um, on our ADRC webpage. And this, this podcast is produced by our Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, Dr. Chen interviews leading scientists and caregiving experts about the latest in Alzheimer's disease, news, research, and caregiver resources. And it's an incredible unbiased source of information for anybody who's interested in, in memory and changes in memory. So now I want to hand this over to, to Dr. Nathaniel Chen. Thank you, Dr. Edwards, for that introduction. I'm happy to be here. And as, as Dr. Edwards said, I'm a geriatrician. And so I spend my time working in a memory clinic and with our wonderful researchers at, and participants at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Program, the RAP study. I spent a lot of time in both of those places focusing on healthy lifestyle habits, ways to reduce one's cognitive and physical decline as they get older. Um, and in doing so, I spent a lot of time specifically talking about restorative sleep, which is not the same thing as just sleep in general or getting seven hours of sleep. And I personally think sleep is something that needs to be intentional like exercising or mental stimulation. And for those of you that have listened to some of my episodes on, on the Dementia Matters podcast, you know that I've had Dr. Barzi on to talk about the importance of sleep for a healthy life. And that's back in November 21st of 2017. Dr. Barzi, I can't remember that far back, but that's when we, we did that wonderful episode. And I've also had a researcher working under Dr. Benlin talking about the science of sleep and brain health. And that was back in August 14th of 2018. So I encourage people to listen to those episodes. They're still relevant. So sleep is incredibly important to our health and well-being, but it also feels good. And when done correctly, we notice that. Uh, in my first of the 2023 podcast that came out January 10th, I talk about healthy habits and I hone in on sleep. And there's a reason for that. Um, I have not been getting my own adequate amount of sleep for the past six months, thanks to my, my beautiful baby boy, Bennett. Uh, but things are starting to change and I can feel the difference already. Uh, so sleeping poorly to going to sleeping better is something that is important and, and something one recognizes. Um, but I also noticed that with poor sleep, I wasn't doing the other healthy habits that we like to talk about in our Alzheimer's program. And because of that experience, I recognize for me, sleep has been foundational, not only as a health habit, but really to then further the other healthy habits. Uh, so that really amazes me. And in clinic, I'll say that I'm always impressed by people who get used to inadequate sleep and still function. But I wanna end my, my introduction by saying there is a difference between surviving 
and thriving. And one can survive with little sleep or less sleep, but if you really want your quality of life to be at the best it can be, I would argue that sleep is where we start. But we'll have the opportunity to really ask our experts that question. Um, so I'm gonna uh, have the honor of introducing you to um, Dr. Barb Benlin, a University uh, of Wisconsin researcher. She's a professor in the Division of Geriatrics and Gerontology within medicine. She's the leader of our research education component in the Wisconsin ADRC. She's the director of the UW-Madison Neuroscience and Public Policy Program. And her research focuses on the interplay of factors contributing to health and a, de a decreased health in an aging brain. Uh, so she's looking at modifiable risk factors, things like sleep, diet, microbial influences, midlife metabolic disorders, and how they may contribute to or protect um, Alzheimer's, against Alzheimer's disease. And then our second guest, as I've alluded to, Dr. Stephen Barzi, he's a faculty member in the Division of Geriatrics and Gerontology as well in the Department of Medicine. He's an attending physician at the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital, uh, where he's the clinical director of our Division of Geriatrics. He's the director of the Geriatrics Patient Aligned Care Team and the director of the Sleep Telemedicine Program. He's also a trained sleep specialist working at the Wisconsin Sleep Clinic. So he's only one of a handful of people specializing in both geriatric medicine and sleep medicine. So with that, I'd like to get started. Uh, and at any time during the discussion, please feel free to you watching to type and send a question into the chat box. Uh, and time permitting, we're, we wanna address as many of those questions as we can. One caveat to that, and I'm sure you've heard me say this before, is that we are gonna be asking our two wonderful panelists about general sleep trends and recommendations, but nothing specific to the individual. Uh, I'm not gonna ask them to make personalized care plans for us as much as I know we would all like that. So please try to keep those questions as broad as you can. So with that, Dr. Barzi, I'd like to start with you. And just so we can have some foundational knowledge, can you describe the different stages of the sleep cycle and what happens in each stage as we sleep? You're muted, Dr. Barzi. Thank you, Nate, um, for both reminding me as well as the question. <laughs> um, so yeah, sleep is, is not really uh, uniform across the night. And we've known this for many, many years. Um, and I think as anyone who's had a chance to read the book recognizes, we break it up into two broad categories. We call them non-REM sleep and REM sleep. So um, REM means rapid eye movement. And it was the way we described this one phase of sleep very early and continues to be described. Many people might know REM sleep also as dream sleep. Um, so within non-REM sleep, we have some numbers. We have a, a stage one, which represents the most shallow stage of sleep. It's kind of transitional. And in this stage, many of us might still kind of be thinking we're awake, but we're not quite awake. Uh, brain waves look different. Um, and stage two sleep is kind of the workhorse. That's what we spend the vast majority of the night in. And that phase of sleep um, is uh, in its own right, uh, uh, very important for maintenance issues. Um, and, and then there's the deep phase of sleep, um, stage three sleep, which we'll get into maybe some discussion a little bit later, but it has some very important roles for, uh, for pruning memory, for consolidating certain aspects of memory, for reinforcing certain new memory traces. Um, likewise, it helps us to forget. And so in that regard, it's, it's very important too, because we just can't hold on to all the information that comes into our brain and body every day. Um, and then, <clears throat> as I described, REM or rapid eye movement sleep. And rapid eye movement sleep is a lot more like wakefulness than it actually is like sleep. And if you look at brainwave patterns in this phase, they look a lot more like wakefulness, but there are some clear distinctions. You know, for example, when we're in REM sleep and potentially dreaming, our body is mostly paralyzed. And so, you know, although we have all this vivid imagery going on, we're not able to really act on that, thankfully, because otherwise, um, as is the case with some special patients, um, people can fly out of bed and, and flail and hit their bed partners and all kinds of other things. So during REM sleep, our brain is very active, 
but our body is, is largely paralyzed. Um, and we cycle through these phases of sleep as the night progresses. So we start out in stage one, go to two and rapidly into stage three sleep. And then we get to our first REM cycle. And then we keep following that pattern, oftentimes for three or four cycles through the night. Um, one last comment I'll make is we do tend to have a lot more of that deep sleep in the early phase of the night. And we tend to have a lot more of that rapid eye movement or REM sleep in the later phase. And so that's kind of what we call normal sleep architecture. So, um, and uh, I think that uh, probably starts the base. Okay, so, and a couple of key things that I'm taking away from that is th there are four sleep stages, one, two, three, and, and REM all have a purpose, but then also, you know, there's a, a cycle to it because you go through this full cycle, you're doing three to four cycles. Well, how does that fit when we hear about circadian rhythm? And so how does, how does the sleep stages or just the, the sleep cycles fit with circadian rhythm? How does circadian rhythm itself work? Could you, could you comment sure. on that? Yes. So circadian rhythm or circadia just means kind of about a day. And there are many circadian rhythms in our body, things that control our blood pressure, things that control our stress hormones in our body, as well as things that control alertness. So most of us have a certain phase when we are most alert. And um, there's a circadian rhythm that controls that alertness. And so as we get up in the morning, um, well, typically first thing in the morning, we're pretty well rested from the night's the night sleep. And our body really doesn't need to be extra alert during that phase. And so that circadian phase of, of alertness is there, but not as strong. But as we stay up and as the day progresses, there's all kinds of, of things that happen within our brain, byproducts that accumulate that are part of the normal brain and thinking and um, process. And in fact, some of those byproducts serve another role. They tend to actually make us a little more and more tired. So it, logically, the longer we stay up, the more tired we get, and large, and that's in part because of those various chemicals. As we stay up longer, our brain and our body needs to compensate for those accumulating chemicals. And so that circadian um, driver of alertness tends to become stronger and stronger through the day, with an exception of a little blip somewhere between around 12 o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon. So that's where most cultures around the world celebrate um, uh, siesta. Um, we happen to be an anti-napist culture, so that's a little different. But, but in general, after we have that dip, then once again, it becomes very strong into the evening hours when finally it has a rapid descent. And it's that rapid descent, plus a couple of other hormonal things happening in our body, they start to prepare our body for this sleep phase. And when those chemicals have accumulated through the day, and when the circadian rhythm for alertness drops off, that's the perfect time to start to have a, a good night's sleep. Two quick follow-up questions to that. Would you then argue it's it would be appropriate to have a quick nap? in a, you know, in a pro napist culture between the hours of 12 <laughs> and three? Yes, I am a big fan of naps and I wish I could uh, experience more of them myself. But um, yes, uh, the general rule of thumb is um, to nap during that dip seems to be kind of almost biological in nature, but we do tend to forewarn people that napping for too long or napping too late in the day can sometimes have a detrimental effect on your overnight sleep. So I'm a big fan for napping, but I usually encourage people to nap probably closer to that noon to one, noon to two o'clock hour, and certainly not probably after about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, because that will push down those chemicals that are kind of accumulating and there to help us to naturally get to sleep. And that's my second follow-up question, which is, is one of those chemicals melatonin? Because I'm anticipating someone asking a question about that. Absolutely. Okay. So melatonin is um, secreted 
um, within our brain um, in, in an area in the center of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And melatonin uh, is what some people call the hormone of darkness. It typically does start to build as the day progresses. I, and, and I mean, as the night um, progresses. And um, it plays some very important roles for preparing our brain for sleep. Okay. Hormone of darkness. I haven't heard that before, but it, as someone who has taken melatonin, it, it's not a negative thing. So, um, <laughs> so Dr. <laughs> Dr. Benlin, please tell us what some of the benefits of restful sleep are, especially the cognitive benefits. Sure. First, I want to say hormone of darkness could maybe be a good heavy metal band name. So <laughs> keep that in mind for your second career, Steve. Um, so with regard to benefits of uh, sleep, um, actually, Dr. Barcy already mentioned uh, a little bit around this with regard to memory function. So there have been a lot of studies that uh, indicate that when we have uh, periods of learning and then we have periods of rest, that, that, sl that the sleep actually helps us consolidate memories. So make them essentially more firm in the brain. Um, and he also mentioned some interesting work that actually uh, was uh, done here in Wisconsin to show kind of the biological mechanisms by which memories can also be cleared from the brain. So there's some things that we don't need to remember that are cleared which then allows us to put down uh, additional new memories. Um, but with regard to, you know, thinking more about um, sleep disorders and cognitive function, uh, there's quite a lot of literature suggesting that um, among people who have sleep disorders, such as uh, sleep apnea, um, that there can be negative impacts for cognitive function. Um, there was a really large study. It was, it's a meta-analysis. So it's actually an analysis of many studies. They included over 4 million uh, older adults. And what they found was that uh, sleep apnea was associated with more cognitive decline um, and also increased risk for dementia. So I guess the flip side, the good news for that is that we do have uh, treatments uh, for sleep apnea. So it's very important to pick up on sleep apnea because it is most often treatable. And Barb, you, you, you kind of went into my second question too. So there are benefits, some cognitive, other whole body related to sleep, but then there is a relationship at least starting to build uh, in the sleep literature between poor sleep and things like Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. Could you speak to some of that specific literature and, and frankly studies yeah. that you've been a part of? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I wanna, you know, I first wanna stress that most people don't believe that if you don't sleep, you will get Alzheimer's disease. And I do get asked that question and I know people worry, you know, that if they're having poor sleep, it means dementia. And that's actually not the case at all. Um, but that said, we do know that there is some links between um, sleep, dis sleep disruption, sleep disorders, increased risk for dementia, but it's not true for everybody. Um, we also know that there are some specific links with the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So there is, uh, there does seem to be a relationship between sleep and uh, one of the proteins that's involved in Alzheimer's disease, specifically amyloid. Um, so there have been some really interesting studies in animals, for example, um, you can engineer an animal to overproduce amyloid and then do some experiments to see what happens in their brain. So if you sleep deprive those animals, they actually deposit more plaque in the brain. Um, and in turn, the more plaques they have in the brain, um, the worse their sleep is. So those are in animal studies. Um, we also know uh, from animal studies that there seems to be something called the glymphatic system, which has been observed um, to actually, some colloquial terms are actually brainwashing. So when uh, animals and, and presumably also humans uh, go to sleep, there seems to be an increased um, flow of cerebral spinal fluid through the brain, which also uh, removes amyloid from the brain. Um, and the other kind of interesting thing about this is that when we're awake, we produce more amyloid. Um, and when we're sleeping, we seem to clear amyloid. So this sort of makes you think that if you do have disrupted sleep overnight, it's possible that you're, you know, both increasing your production of amyloid and then poss possibly clearing less of it. Um, 
So those are just a, a few studies. There's actually, you know, a whole plethora of studies, um, but we'll stop there and see kind of what your follow-up questions might be. Well, in addition to sort of the process or pathology of Alzheimer's, there are risk factors, just regular chronic health risk factors that lead, that increase risk for Alzheimer's or dementia. But then sleep may have a fact, have a relationship to those. And so how does, right. how does the interplay with just sort of a sleep disorder, like you mentioned, and some of these other chronic health conditions as that relates to cognitive change? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, there are some studies that suggest these links with amyloid, which kind of brings it back to Alzheimer's disease specifically, because, you know, when we're talking about the pathology, maybe we want to know if sleep is specifically related to amyloid. But we also know that um, sleep disorders can be associated with other health conditions. So, for example, vascular risk factors, increased risk for type 2 diabetes, um, obesity, dementia, something called insulin resistance, which is also associated with, um, with type 2 diabetes or your body's inability to respond to insulin. And so all of those conditions, which are also associated with um, poor sleep, those in turn can also be linked with uh, dementia risk. Um, and it, it may not be through amyloid, it could be through vascular risk factors. Um, so there have been some studies suggesting that um, sleep disorders can also increase vascular dysfunction in the brain, which could then contribute to increased risk for dementia. More reasons why sleep matters so much. Thank you, Dr. Benlin. Now, so Dr. Barzi, I have a couple questions for you related to how much timing of sleep, but before I get to those, we have a great question from the audience wanting to follow up on the melatonin question. Do you advise or what do you think about prescription melatonin versus over-the-counter brands? And related to that, how do we know that uh, over-the-counter actually contains the melatonin that might be meaningful to us? Oh, I wish I could answer that question clearly. Um, let me say that, first off, when our body secretes melatonin, into the system to do its series of, of actions. It, it um, is fractions, fractions of what the amount is of a standard melatonin pill that you can buy over the counter. Um, it's, it, it, in fact, what's believed is actually smaller doses for shifting that clock are probably more effective than larger doses. But, to get to the question about the purity, this is a tricky thing because melatonin is considered a health supplement. It is not a prescription item. And for that reason, the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA really doesn't have any input into the regulation of this area. Now, historically, there have been many, many companies that have made melatonin products. And when uh, uh, I love to quote a study that was done, oh my goodness, over a decade ago now, where a company, a chemistry, a chemistry company took about 12 or 15 products off of the shelves um, and they analyzed the um, content and the amount of melatonin actually within those. And no surprise, it was all over the board from several su supplements that had almost no melatonin in them to some of them that were dramatically more. And then interestingly enough, there was even some that had other things laced within the melatonin that would not have been something we would want. Um, the tricky thing is there isn't an equivalent for the FDA, although there are some organizations now that are trying to be watchdog organizations and trying to assess the validity and the accuracy and the honesty of these various companies. All I can tell you is that a lot of times your pharmacists will refer to some of those other organizations and probably the best person to ask about the, the reliability of a particular product might be the pharmacist. Um, but even so, I, you know, I just warn people that you may not be getting what you think. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Barzi. And that that's uh, when in my own clinic, I'll tell people about third party sites and third party testing. But the pharmacist is a wonderful idea since they're very familiar in that world. Um, 
So then going, moving on to quantity and quality of sleep, does everyone really need seven or eight hours of sleep a night? Well, it's a great question. And I get, it, I get asked that question all the time in both my clinic, as well as, you know, when I'm talking to the public, the answer to that is no, um, that we all have certain genetic makeups um, and uh, even certain what we call chronotypes, which we might get into talking about later. And within this, it's, it's kind of like a bell-shaped curve, like many other areas of medicine. And there are individuals that are um, very, very fortunate to probably be able to get by with lower amounts of sleep and feel and look and perform very close to what would be considered normal. Now, most of us in the audience are thinking, well, that means they're lucky and they're only getting to sleep three or four hours a night. And that's not the case. Much research suggests that when you go below six or six and a half hours, you really start to see impairments, no matter how much a person states that they are a short sleeper. Um, but the bell-shaped curve suggests that most of us probably need somewhere between about seven and nine hours of sleep. And so you'll frequently hear people quote the average of eight hours. But there are others who are on the other side of this curve that it's important to recognize that really need more than even nine hours of sleep. They may need nine and a half, they may need 10 hours. And when they get eight hours, they're actually partially sleep deprived. So it is complicated. And there isn't a great blood test or measurement out there that'll say you are a, an eight hour sleeper, you're a nine hour sleeper. What I usually tell people is if you allow yourself to sleep as much as your body wants, you will figure out what is a restful phase for you. And I guarantee you, some in the audience will say they're a 10 hour sleeper. If they get nine hours, they drag. And then people like myself who tend to be a slightly shorter sleeper, and if I sleep more than seven and a half hours, I get in this what's called sleep inertia, which means I'm in a fog when I wake up, and it's harder for me. So there is a variability in the quantity. Now, to get to the, I think the other part of your question, which was the quality, this comes back to those uh, cycles that I talked about early on which are that we can kind of look at and expect to see what a normal brain architecture looks like. And we, you know, and so we can identify individuals who might have health issues or might have other psychological factors going on that disrupt their sleep, or maybe they're taking substances. And again, um, you alluded to the fact or alcohol, or maybe Dorothy did, and we hopefully we'll chat about that a little later, but there are many substances that alter our sleep and so that we don't get the normal cycle and normal rhythm. In fact, one of the earliest sleeping pills and still one that's out on the market, which are called benzodiazepine medications, they actually alter our sleep so we spend a lot of time in stage two sleep and much less time in deep or in REM sleep. So the quality of sleep is probably as or more important than the absolute quantity. And that's where you know we have to be very thoughtful about considering what are health factors, what are medication issues, what are other environmental factors that might be altering the sleep quality. Um, and therefore influencing all kinds of cognitive as well as body factors. Thank you, Dr. Barzi. It's very validating. One, two key points I want our audience to hear that is, you know, less than six hours is not good for us. And for those people who think that they can do well on four hours, probably not. You're probably not one of those people. You probably have gotten used to four hours, but it's something worth looking into. One of the other things that Dr. Walker mentions in his book is this idea of chronotype. And so what if you're a night owl or a morning lark, or you spent your whole life doing one of those, should a person follow their body or should they go to bed at a certain time that they're told to do? Certainly. The, this is a big societal issue <laughs> because um, until really only recently, um, our culture has been fixed on certain types of work hours and certain types of school hours. 
And those hours have been set oftentimes by convenience or by maybe daylight or whatnot. But they don't necessarily allow for people to, to, to manifest the full range of their chronotypes. And so in particular, getting back to what you're describing, the individual who might be the night owl and naturally feels much more comfortable going to bed later and waking up later, they are unfortunately tortured by many of societal's kind of patterns and rules. Um, starting in, in, in elementary and in high school and such, and moving along throughout most people's work careers. Because in many of those individuals, we're asking them to get up during their sleep phase and to somehow let their brain function at, an, at a level as some of their peers who might not be in that category. Um, and that's, and not only that, but this group probably is more sleep deprived in general because of these societal kinds of decisions that have been made. Um, and unfortunately, as that accumulates over a period of years and years, it has its own health consequences. We know, for example, that nurses who do third shift work are much more prone to develop various forms of cancers and heart disease. Um, because they're sleeping out of their normal phase. We also know other health problems that are much more likely to occur. We know that pilots who have to travel across the world and cross multiple time zones experience health consequences much higher proportion, for example, than some of their peers who have more normal sleep and wake rhythms. And so, I, you know, I think most of the biology and most of the science suggests that we should be sleeping the way that our clock is telling us to sleep, not the way that society is telling us to sleep. Thanks, Dr. Barzi. Dr. Benlin, I'm not going to make that meeting tomorrow at 8 a.m., okay? Um, <laughs> well, I do have a question about catching up on sleep, Dr. Benlin. Are we able to do that if we aren't sleeping well during the week or we have meetings too early during the week? Can we catch up on the weekend? Uh, that's a really good question. I think that's a lot. That's something that a lot of people do. Um, I guess the answer, you know, is that if you have, you know, a few nights of poor sleep and you catch up on the weekend, you know, you do feel more rested and you do feel better. Um, but if you're thinking about, you know, health conditions and about like the long-term consequences of sleep deprivation, then that catch up sleep on the weekend isn't actually helping you a whole lot because, you know, you're depriving yourself of sleep over the long term, and that's going to be associated with some of the health repercussions that we discussed, like more vascular risk factors, possibly, you know, more depression, worse immune function, et cetera. So we generally suggest that people follow a routine uh, sleep schedule so that they they actually follow the same schedule on the weekend that they fall that they follow during the week. Um, and kind of the other benefit of that um, relates back to what Dr. D Dr. Barcy was talking about, you know, in terms of circadian rhythms, it's not like your body clock changes on the weekend. It's actually better to, to just have this routine um, and use the same routine every day. I'd like to get your take on the sleep quality question too, and a slightly different angle. Uh, ideally, we would sleep throughout the night, but we know for many people that's not the case and that there, there's nighttime awakenings. You're getting up, maybe it's pain, maybe it's your legs are moving, maybe you have to go use the restroom. Our brain activities, circadian rhythm, sleep stages negatively affected by these sleep interruptions? Um. Yes. And, but also a caution. So, you know, it's not uncommon for people to wake up during the night. Actually, like a lot of people will wake up during the night, but then fall asleep again. Um, and that's even true for older adults who perhaps, you know, wake up to go to the bathroom one time and then get back into bed and fall asleep right away. That doesn't tend to have um, be a big problem for your health. Um, where it can be a greater problem is if you wake up and then you can't fall asleep again, or if you're having repeated awakenings during the night. So exam for example, if you're getting up to go to the bathroom like three or four times in the night, um, because then yes, what you're doing is you're disrupting those um, sleep uh, stages that Dr. Barcy uh, talked about, and you might be depriving yourself of some of those important stages of sleep, like the less, or pardon me, the, the more restorative 
uh, sleep, deep stages of sleep, and also the REM sleep. Um, so in those types of scenarios, um, it's usually suggested that you either, you know, adopt some habits that will help you to not um, have those repeat awakenings and or, of course, you know, speak to your physician. And I'm going to take what you said. So, Dr. Brennan, you mentioned less than one, three to four. And now I'm going to ask you, Dr. Barzi, in a sleep clinic, I know you see lots of different patients. And there's lots of different scenarios, but do you have a number of awakenings that you feel like, okay, that's acceptable. I'm not as worried, or is it more just the, how, if you can't fall back asleep or how long you're awake in between, how do you approach the nighttime awakening scenario in a clinic? It's a great question. And like we were talking about with the variability across individuals, um, some people can wake up three or four times a night and assuming that there aren't other things going on negatively with their sleep, they may wake up the next day and feel fine and perform very well. So I think the same holds. There are, there's actually genetic makeup that predisposes some people to be more tolerant of interruptions or even modest, I'd say modest sleep deprivation than others. And in fact, there's a, there's even suggestion that some people who have that type of relative resistance towards some of those interruptions, gravitate towards occupations that would allow for that to be acceptable. You know, um, there's, a, there's a study done a while back looking at critical care or ICU doctors who tend to, um, you know, have to deal with a lot more uh, tolerance towards sleep interruptions and such than say other areas of medicine. And um, looking at the chronotypes and looking at some of the biological makeup, it seems like there's probably a predisposing factor. So to get back to your question, though, I think in general, when you start to see people waking up more than three or four times a night, the likelihood is pretty high that they're going to start to experience some negative consequences and how they feel. And then if we really are studying them in a laboratory over a period, in a research paradigm over a period of multiple days, we can also see that it does seem to negatively influence some of those sleep cycles that I was talking about. And Dr. Benlin, you made a reference to sleep habits in your last answer, and that's perfect because my next question for you is about sleep hygiene. And that's a popular term, it's, it's used frequently. What do you consider to be good sleep hygiene and what are some tools that we could use to improve our sleep? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I do want to just stress again, like there, that there are sometimes factors outside of our control that could affect our uh, sleep quality. Um, but sleep hygiene refers to factors that maybe are under your own control um, so that things that you can do to improve, improve your uh, sleep. So, you know, couple of those things we've already mentioned. So we mentioned, you know, sticking to a consistent uh, sleep schedule, including on the weekends, um, having a routine again, so that your body is used to, you know, certain times that you uh, are going to bed. Um, people also suggest that you keep your sleep environment uh, comfortable um, and that you keep your sleep environment cool. Um, because the cooling of the body actually will improve the quality of your sleep. Um, keep your bedroom dark so lights can disrupt sleep. Uh, so some people suggest getting blackout curtains or even wearing a sleep mask. Um, so just reducing the amount of light in your room. Um, now, this is a difficult one, avoiding electronic devices, which have become so pervasive in our lives. And um, often we're watching TV or checking the news or checking our email, looking at our phones before bed. Um, so to the extent that you can reduce that uh, directly before going to sleep, that's, that's usually a good idea. Um, we also recommend that you avoid uh, caffeine later in the day um, and also alcohol because that can uh, disrupt your sleep cycles as well. Um, another thing that that is also recommended and can sometimes be difficult is to manage stress. Um, so in the evening, um, a lot of people can sometimes find that they have, you know, that they're reviewing the day's events, they're thinking about things that maybe didn't go so well. 
they're thinking about what they need to do the next day. Um, so those types of, of activities aren't super conducive to, um, to sleeping well. Uh, so, you know, thinking about ways to clear your mind, rest, relax, um, journaling, you know, those types of techniques that can help, um, help ease your mind before you go to sleep. I'll just add my own little personal comment to that because they uh, these are all wonderful suggestions. And I would say in my, in my experience for any of the, the parents watching this, we spend so much time trying to get our children to fall asleep. Well, those are the same things we should say to ourselves and apply to our ourselves. This idea of, of sleep habits, this process of easing into sleep. We do it for other people, but we tend not to do it for ourselves. I guess this feeds into Dr. Barzi's anti napas culture. We're, we're not we're not pro sleep hygiene or pro putting the energy into ourselves and we should. And so um, thank you for those tips, Dr. Benlin. I did wanna ask your thoughts on, is it true that women need almost two hours more sleep than men every night or that men can function better on less sleep? We hear this frequently, but is there really any truth to it? I am not aware of any research studies that suggest um, these stark differences in sleep requirements between uh, men and women. I think we can, you know, take those recommendations um, with regard to sleep times that uh, Dr. Barcy suggested. suggested. Um, I am glad that you brought up potential gender differences, though, because I do know, for example, for women um, going through menopause, that that can also affect uh, sleep. Um, so there might be, you know, other considerations that women want to take uh, into consideration to help promote their own better sleep. Um, so, for example, hot flashes can be common in menopause. Um, and so, you know, there are some strategies, again, around, you know, keeping your bedroom cool, using a fan, um, even considering, you know, what kind of sheets you use when you go to bed or, you know, other other ways to make yourself comfortable when you're sleeping um, and also not, you know, making sure that you talk to your physician if you're concerned about um, menopause symptoms and how those might be affecting your sleep. And Dr. Barzi, it's been discussed sleep apnea. Dr. Benlin talked about it as one of those important medical conditions to think about. It's a known risk factor for cognitive decline. It's also very of the sleep disorders, it's a very common one. What is the relationship exactly with obstructive sleep apnea or sleep apnea and cognitive change? And, and what should people be on the lookout for if they think they could or their partner could have sleep apnea? So sleep apnea is one of the more common sleep disorders that we see. Um, and it, it's um, even more common as we've seen a an epidemic of increased body weight in our culture. But it, I want to be really clear in that there are different, what I call phenotypes, or different types of sleep apnea. And those types can actually affect different patient populations. So in my geriatric sleep practice, I can see a lot of individuals who are relatively thin or thin and still have sleep apnea, sometimes quite severe sleep apnea. And that's because there's more going on than simply just body mass. Um, so um, a comment I do make about sleep apnea and, and, and its relationship to overall status is as we get older, what can happen is that some of the important muscles up in our throat and, and that normally keep the airway open can become infiltrated with more scar tissue and more fat tissue and have less actual muscle mass. And that may be an important factor. There also are changes where the, how the brain is connected and wired to tell us to breathe and how some of those kind of neural connections might change as we get older and as we develop certain age-related health issues. So, so there are different forms of sleep apnea. Now to get to the uh, meat of your question, which is how might sleep apnea influence our cognition or our thinking and our, and our memory? There's actually several different mechanisms. There's short-term and long-term mechanisms. So the shortest term mechanisms are simply that when a person is waking up and it could be upwards of one or even um, more times a minute, 
all night long, their night, their architecture for their sleep looks very different. They spend a lot more time in shallow stage sleep, coming from wakefulness down to that and never really getting that, that deep sleep or that REM sleep to the extent that they should. And so this produces a, a form of fragmentation, which then leads to next day problems with attention and concentration and focus. Also, even our short-term memory, how, how efficient we are at storing information becomes altered by that. So in that regard, sleep apnea is inter interfering with memory because it's depriving you of quality sleep. More downstream though, some work, actually research that I did a few years back now in the VA, we looked at the influence of sleep apnea on bl cerebral blood flow and peripheral blood flow. And what we discovered was that when a person was having an apneic event, a pause with their breathing, the longer that pause lasted, the higher their blood pressure went, the more their heart rate control um, uh, fluctuated. And in fact, it influenced certain um, nerves that are the nerves that control our blood vessels throughout our body. And so that sympathetic nerve activity increased. So the more downstream consequences of long-standing sleep apnea are that we see more uh, high blood pressure. We see more influence on controlling um, some of those conditions that Dr. Bendlin shared, like blood sugar control, diabetes, and even hormones that control our weight um, become substantially influenced by sleep apnea. So all those things then cause more blood vessel disease in the brain, which over the long run may, in combination with other factors, uh, influence the likelihood of dementia. So those are some of the mechanisms. We know there's still a lot to be understood. Um, but in general, we can say that there are several good reasons why a person who might have sleep apnea should have it addressed by their by a health provider. Nate, if I can if I can add to Dr. Barcy's yeah. comments, there are also, um, you know, with regard to what I'm familiar with in terms of the brain imaging literature, um, there is also the suggestion that maybe when you have these um, pauses in breathing, that that's also going to affect the amount of oxygen that your brain is getting. And there's parts of the brain that are quite um, vulnerable to pauses in oxygen delivery. And one of those is the hippocampus, which we know is um, very important for memory function and also shows some atrophy in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's, that's certainly um, going to be problematic. Uh, and with regard to some of those vascular changes that Dr. Barcy was describing, we know from brain imaging studies that people with sleep apnea tend to have more vascular brain lesions. So they show up in, in brain images and you can actually see some of the tissue injury due to those vascular changes. And, and actually, Nate, one last comment I will make is that the other thing we know about sleep apnea is it, it's a what's called a pro-inflammatory condition. So meaning just whatever is going on with the body and with fluctuations in oxygen, it tends to really rev up some of the areas in the body that are important for creating inflammation, which in some cases is good, but we believe too much inflammation, inflammation in the brain is probably not a good thing. So that may be yet another mechanism. I mean, you two have listed four or five different things. Barb, you want another one you want to mention? Well, I have, I mean, I have a follow-up question for Dr. Barcy, which is, um, you know, what are the barriers to sleep apnea treatment? So, you know, are, are your patients um, using CPAP and, and how, you know, are there any barriers to using CPAP? Yeah, so CPAP is uh, continuous positive airway pressure. It's when we deliver air at a, a, you know, um, into the upper airway, which then kind of keeps the airway from collapsing and allows us to have more natural breathing pattern. The CPAP or BiPAP or other forms of, of, of systems are usually administered through a little machine and the air then is delivered through a mask. Masks 
I have come a long way. It used to be we had these big creatures that sit on the face and nobody would love them. In fact, they were despised. But as time progressed, we've got more and more sophisticated. Now there are literally over 75 or 80 varieties of masks on the market. Um, what I would say, though, is it still takes some acclimation. And I tell people, especially when I'm working with them in the when they're first diagnosed, it's those first couple, two, three weeks that are critical. And that's the time when our body is really starting to get used to this different machine and this error. And I tell people that's going to be the time that can be very frustrating. But if you can get through those first two or three weeks, continue to use it, it gets better. And it gradually gets better and better. We also use a lot of co coaching and coaxing and other kinds of what we call habituation strategies in our sleep clinic to help people to adapt and use the system much more effectively. So if you just get ordered a sleep test, someone comes by and drops off a machine and you never interact with someone who really works with you on how to adapt to using that, you're going to be unfortunately in that group that's going to really struggle. But I tell people who've had a bad experience once around, that doesn't mean you can't use this system effectively. We just may need to use some coaching, some other strategies to help you to adapt. We may have to try three, four, five masks. There's just many ways that we can help this to work. And there are other approaches. So some people can use oral appliances. If it's mild enough, that's sufficient and that will help. There are some approaches of surgeries. And in fact, in recent years, there's even some ways that we can stimulate nerves that go to the tongue and other muscles in the body. Those newest approaches are ones that are probably in early phases. We use them in some clinical situations, but we're still kind of in version one. And I expect that over time, we're going to see uh, substantial improvements in that. I suppose the good thing to having so many people in the world with sleep issues is that there's a lot of research and a lot of productivity in developing tools to help people. We have a great question from the audience. I love this. Uh, for both of our experts here, so I'll, each one of you, please answer. Dr. Walker has a lot of suggestions for healthier sleep. What is one idea that you would put into action for your own current quality of sleep? <laughs> So Dr. Badlam, why don't we start with you? I'm sorry, all I can think about was his tip about um, pilots taking a nap before the transatlantic flight. So I guess if I ever have to, you know, do fly an airplane over the Atlantic, I'll have a nap at the beginning of my shift and not later. Um, I think the, I like the, I like the routine suggestion. I think that was one of his suggestions, it was, but, you yes. know, um, just being mindful and um, recognizing that, you know, it's time for, it's time for bed. Uh, no more chores, no more uh, non-sleep activities, no more fretting about the next day. Um, and just taking that seriously, you know, to the extent that it's possible to do that um, and, and life is not too chaotic. I think just prioritizing sleep and making sure to get as many hours um, as you need to get a restful sleep. All right, Dr. Barzi. He stole my answer. No, but I can I can offer up some uh, additions. So you're you're going to take a nap before we fly the plane too. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> um, no, I'm a big fan of naps, but actually my re my response is we have to understand that our um, our body and our sleep phases were all developed at at a, another era. And our and although we evolve, we don't evolve that quickly. And so the comment that that you made, Dr. Chin, about being sent, being careful about environmental exposures such as light are very important. And I find, so I, where I, I burn the candle on both sides a little bit. And I find myself um, being in front of devices that emit blue light. Uh, more and closer to bedtime than I really should be. And that I think for me is one of the bigger challenges is um, I do know the value of a good night's sleep. And I, I can tell you over and over again that 
if for people who think they're being far more productive by cutting a couple hours of sleep out every night, you know, remember, you may not be actually, unless you're a, tr a true night owl chronotype, you're, you're probably not going to be functioning at your highest level anyway when you're carving out those last few hours. And so I myself am very careful. Um, I, now, I do go to bed later, but I try very hard to be pretty consistent. And then one other little comment that hasn't come up today is um, the relationship between exercise and activity level and sleep. And I think it's really important to recognize that maintaining an active life and exercising at strategic times of the day and being consistent about when you exercise, just like being consistent about when you go to sleep, can also be really helpful for a healthy night's sleep. All right. Thank you both. There was a kind of general answers, but I think uh, we appreciate the experts admitting that even they have things that they can work on. We do have some follow-up questions from the audience about the REM sleep explanation. And these are great questions, so please keep those coming. Is it possible to have REM sleep without dreams? Or another way of thinking about it is, if I don't remember my dream, was was my REM sleep actually adequate? Is that an indicator that perhaps your sleep quality has been compromised? Um, Barb, I don't know if you want me to, to jump into this one for starters. You go for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what we know uh, are from lots of examples of people being brought in the sleep lab, people who say, I never dream, <laughs> um, is in fact that um, they may very, they are dreaming. And, and mm -hmm. there are, there are some people that don't remember their dreams as well, or, and, and so it's pretty rare unless you're on medicines or unless you've got some kind of, of, uh, a specific health or, or a mental health diagnosis, it's rare to not have REM sleep. Um, and in fact, most of us, unless we really have one of those problems, are having at least three or four cycles of REM. Um, and so um, not remembering your dreams isn't the same thing as not having REM sleep. Um, and so uh, for those who are worried because they're not you know, maybe remembering all their dreams or hardly remembering dreams, it would be unusual that you weren't having rapid eye movement sleep. Dr. Van, did you want to add something to that? Or I think, I think that's a great answer. Yeah. There's a, another question related to REM sleep. When you nap, let's say you are a napper, you're pro nap, you nap at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, are you going to go through REM sleep in the other three stages during a nap? Typically not, unless it's going to be, it depends on the length of the nap. So what we often will suggest is kind of that, probably that ideal, you know, well, what people believe might be an ideal nap duration might sit somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. Most of us, aren't going to enter REM sleep until at least 60 to 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So unless you are taking a long nap you're, you're, or unless you have a, a certain sleep disorder, because there are various sleep disorders in certain medical conditions where people do jump into REM sleep much quicker. But in general, assuming that's not the case, if you get a 30 to 45 minute nap, you're probably not going to have a lot of REM sleep or any REM sleep appreciable. The, the little caveat is if you are chronically sleep deprived, then when you do go to nap, then your body might selectively go towards one or, or, or several of the forms of sleep that it's not been getting. So when we see someone come into the sleep lab and they pop right into REM sleep and we don't have any reason to believe they have a, a, another form of sleep disorder, we usually assume it's because they're sleep deprived. Oh, wow. And just to, to add to that, Steve, um, I think maybe, I don't know if we talked about like ideal nap times, but you had mentioned 30 to 45 minutes. And that can, I think, I believe, make people feel a little bit more refreshed, but not interfere with their evening sleep, right? So, you know, a good reason to keep the daytime naps short is so that you can get the full restful sleep at night. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Dr. Brenlin. That was one of our other questions. So you were able to answer that. Someone has asked about sleep positions and is there a better sleep position just in general for optimal sleep? Or if you are worried about your breathing difficulties, not necessarily sleep apnea, but if you are thinking about that, is there a better position for somebody? Great question. And um, there's a lot of companies out there who make mattresses and other things who'd like to make you believe that there is, there's absolute dogma. And yes, there's a certain position. I think um, my, my quick response is that there are some body positions that maybe um, uh, are more vulnerable for certain things. So for example, that sleep breathing issue, we know that people are more prone to have abnormal breathing when they are on their back or supine compared to on their sides. Um, we also know that if a person has another medical condition, let's say they've got a bad shoulder, or they've got a bad hip, then being in a position that's going to alleviate or limit some of the pain that might be associated with that, that joint is also going to be a better position for them. Uh, persons who have bad acid reflux, Elevating the head of their bed a little bit will prevent or potentially prevent some of that acid from coming up. So the answer is yes, but it depends on kind of what we're looking to improve. We have a question from a research participant. We do a lot of lumbar punctures at our Alzheimer's program. So Dr. Benlin, what can you tell from the spinal fluid that you mm -hmm. collect when it comes to sleep? and how it might relate to Alzheimer's disease. What do you do with the spinal fluid? Well, first of all, I wanna thank uh, the research participant um, for being in research. It's so super appreciated. Um, so thanks to actually anybody on this call that's um, a participant in research, we so appreciate it. And lumbar puncture is a particularly precious fluid. Um, so for those of you that have provided uh, cerebral spinal fluid, again, super thanks. Um, the fluid bathes the brain um, and we, we collect that fluid so that we can actually underst understand more about brain health because there's proteins um, in the brain that are then released into the fluid and they can tell us the state of the brain health. They can tell us about Alzheimer's disease because we can measure um, amyloid and tau proteins in the cerebral spinal fluid. We can also measure uh, proteins that are related to uh, shrinkage of the brain or atrophy or brain injury, and also um, some signals related to neuroinflammation. Um, and there's actually specific brain cells uh, that are involved in immune function. They're called glial cells. And they will also release proteins that we can then measure in the fluid. So let's say we wanted to understand if someone, you know, if sleep, like not one person, but like across a population, let's say we want to understand if less sleep is associated with more brain pathology, then we could measure those proteins. We could do overnight sleep studies, or we could ask people questions about their sleep. And then we could see, you know, if those measures of sleep are related to what we're seeing in the cerebral spinal fluid. And so we have done those kinds of studies before, and we have found that, um, that people who report not uh, feeling refreshed when they wake up, or they feel like they're not getting enough sleep, that we see differences in the cere cerebral spinal fluid levels of proteins, um, suggesting that, that that poor sleep could be having an impact on the brain, or it's also possible brain disease can be having an impact on their sleep. It's really hard to tell, you know, because it's not cause and effect. Um, but just on this topic, there is actually a super interesting study that was done um, at Washington University where they were trying to understand um, the relationship between uh, sleep and amyloid production. And they did something um, particularly uncomfortable, which is that they um, actually took cerebral spinal fluid overnight, you know, with like a continuous sampling of the cerebral spinal fluid overnight. Then they would let people go to sleep, but then as soon as they went into that, um, that deep restorative sleep, they would play a tone to wake the people up from that sleep, to basically deprive them of that deep restorative sleep. 
Um, and what they found was that that had uh, an impact on the amyloid levels in their cerebral spinal fluid. Um, so they were able to kind of directly show that relationship between disrupted sleep and amyloid levels. But it, you know, again, those research participants, wow, <laughs> not, a, not a fun experiment. <laughs> So Dr. Barnes, we've had a few questions. I'm gonna to try to summarize a group of them related to dreaming. And in particular, during REM, if you're dreaming and you're having nightmares, how does that, how does having a nightmare relate to sleep quality, to your REM cycle? Is there an important relationship? Can that have its own effect on sleep disruption? Sure. And that brings, uh, you know, that also um, kind of begs the question about what is dreaming and you know what is its purpose and for those who had an opportunity to read through the book you see that there's actually at least one maybe even several chapters that talk a little bit about the evolving understanding of what dreams represent and um suffice it to say that we used to think that when actually dr sigmund freud thought that everything about our emotional and mental health was about the dream process and there's all kinds of interesting but not always well-founded or grounded kind of um, perspectives about sleep working out all the problems of the day fast forward ahead then as we started understanding more about the electrical patterns of the brain we kind of had a different perspective which is we almost thought that the funny things that were happening in our dreams are more or less just a byproduct of some of this transmission of information from the hippocampus to the other parts of our brain. And this was byproducts with all these bizarre things happening. We now believe it's somewhere in the in between, probably. Um, because, for example, people who've had terrible emotional events, trauma, for example, that influences their memory. Those traumas then going to sleep and having those traumas being consolidated into our brain and into our schema can lead towards you know some of the issues we see in veterans and others who experience post traumatic stress disorder decades later so there's definitely external environmental factors that can influence our dreams years later um and so so I guess I guess what I'll say though is you know I don't want people to start thinking well dreams are negative then because the other point that he makes in the book which is founded with a lot of of good science is that there seems to be relations between REM sleep and creativity and independent thoughts and new ideas and solving problems so the positive for REM sleep is it does breed the problem solving and creativity the negative is that sometimes when those negative emotions have been wired into the brain, those circuits get fired often during the night and those events can come back. Now, it goes way beyond the scope of this discussion, but there's some really important work that's been done both in the VA system as well as outside the VA system that have looked at how we might be able to influence beyond just giving pills, influence some of those traumatic events and things happening at night. And some of this falls within the realm of psychology and certain psychological approaches that are now being used to try to help people to forget or unlearn some of these very difficult events. Thank you, Dr. Barzi. And I think that speaks to, I think there are a few other questions about cognitive behavioral therapy when it comes to sleep. And I feel like you just touched on that. I, I like this last question. I'm going to end with this one. And I feel like it's it's a bit of a challenge to my introduction which I appreciate whoever asked it. The research program talks about diet, exercise, and sleep all being really important factors for our health, our brain health. How would our two sleep experts rate these three in order of importance? You don't need to explain it, but I would like to hear each of you rate them and don't give any half answers. They're all important, we know, but you have to rate them, one, two, and three. Okay, all right. See, diet, sleep, uh, and what? Diet, sleep, and exercise. Okay. And I started with Barb last time. So Dr. Barzing, I'm gonna start with you now. Diet, sleep, exercise, please rank. Hmm. Uh, okay, I'm biased. 
I would argue that the, because of my bias, that I would say sleep would be number one, exercise would be number two, and diet would be number three. But that's not a fair question because all of them are very important. They already, <laughs> had, they already added the caveats. See, that was fair. So Dr. Ben, then you will end. Please rank. Wow. Okay. That's, it's a totally unfair question. And <laughs> Nate, we didn't even get to talk about gut microbiome, which also mm -hmm. relates to diet and the little microbes oh. that live in your gut. They also sleep and have circadian rhythms. But anyway, I, um, I am also doing the same order as Steve, even though it's an extremely unfair question and they're all interrelated. Um, but yes, let's put sleep at, at number one particularly given that it's uh, sleep awareness um, and we're also um, discussing sleep this evening and suffering some sleep deprivation because of the uh, time change. So sleep, number one. I think we all feel validated. All right, thank you, you too. So that's all the time we have for tonight. Although Dr. Ben, then you do allude to, I think a, a future mind readers book club on the, the gut microbiome and its impact on health. So for those taking notes on our our Alzheimer's program team, please write that down. Uh, I'd like to thank you both, Dr. Barzi, Dr. Benlin. Uh, we appreciate you sharing the evening with us and your insights. We're also gonna invite you to find resources for people with dementia and their care partners. For those watching on our website at adrc.wis.edu forward slash care resources. Thank you for changing the slide. And we want uh, everyone here to learn how to get involved in the clinical core. That is one of our research programs. And the Dementia Care Research Project, which is another one, by visiting our open studies webpage at adrc.wisc.edu forward slash open studies. We do have many studies coming forward and sometimes they close, but many new ones come open. So please check that. And I'm gonna have Dr. Dorothy Edwards come back and say a few words and conclude our program. Thank you, Dr. Chen, and I want to thank our great panelists. That was a really interesting discussion, um, and I think we all learned a lot. And I also um, want to apologize if you had a question in the chat and we were unable to get to it because of time. I think that, you know you never know how how long you can make these book club discussions. I just want to also say that the Mind Readers Book Club is an opportunity for any and all of our community members. Um, study participants and study partners to read and discuss a variety of stimulating books. Uh, related to Alzheimer's disease and science and brain health. And so we will be having more book clubs in the future. And so if you have a particular topic or a book that you're interested in, please let us know. Um, we actually are doing this, our discussion tonight came from a recommendation from one of our participants. And so we're always, always open to suggestions. We really want you to know all the things that are happening in the field of Alzheimer's research. We're in a really rapidly changing world. And we want you to have information that's reliable and valid. So I encourage you to stay close to us, look at our webpage, listen to Dr. Chin's podcast. And if you ever have any questions, please let us know. Um, I also want to again, thank our research participants. Uh, uh, their contributions are what drive our field forward. We couldn't do it without you. And we, we really value your willingness to volunteer. And again, look at the webpage. We also have a research registry for those of you who are interested maybe in, in uh, less intensive work, but we always uh, are looking for participants for a number of different studies. The last thing I want to say is that these great discussions don't happen by accident, and we have the most awesome staff. And so I, I, I want to thank Aaron Lacey, Aaron Chin, um, Anik Dupati, and uh, everyone else on our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center team who make um, our jobs easier by doing all the, the hard work and the heavy lifting. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for attending our book club discussion tonight and look forward to seeing you again in the future. So um, uh, stay tuned for the next great discussion. <laughs>